Bom, vamos é, recomeçar. É, é, é um prazer é, apresentar o Olivier Martin, que chegou ao IMPA é, alguns poucos meses. É, o, o Olivier Martin é canadense, mas fez seus estudos é, nos Estados Unidos. E a, após alguns pós-docs, o último acho que foi em Stonybrook, é, ele... É, veio se juntar ao corpo de pesquisadores do INPA. É um geômetro algébrico que vai fazer uma palestra sobre medidas de racionalidade de variedades. Por favor, Olivia. Vai ser em inglês. Obrigado. Uh, so I'll speak in English because my Portuguese is not quite at the level yet. Uh, but feel free to ask questions in Portuguese and if you see me in the corridors, please talk to me in Portuguese. I, I need to, to learn. So it's a, it's a pleasure to learn a new language. It's been so long. Um, so I'll talk about this, uh, this subject that I've been working around, uh, on for, for a few years. So it's a relatively new subject, but it grew out of a, a very long-standing tradition of what are called rationality problems. So I'll start with uh, talking about rationality problems. And our starting point is, is going to be uh, what type of objects we're interested in. And the type of objects we'll be interested in are algebraic varieties. And I'll take a, this is a, an introductory talk, so I'll take a really kind of um, concrete point of view. Let's, let me put it this way. So for me, an algebraic variety is going to be the set of solutions to a system of polynomial equations. So I'll be working over the complex numbers. So you could think, for instance, you might have a system of linear equations. You look at the solutions. That's an example of an algebraic variety. But you might have much more general examples. There's no reason to limit yourself to linear equations. You could look at the equations of all manners of degrees. And you get all sorts of geometric objects in this way. And uh, for a lot of people that do algebraic geometry, they, I mean, of course, it's a question of taste. But for a lot of us, you know, we at least personally, I see this as kind of a very interesting subject because it's kind of at a, a juncture. It's, it's sort of a sweet spot because on the one hand, you have enough polynomials to generate a lot of interesting examples like Grassmannians or whatnot. So you have a lot of interesting examples that come up from having polynomials, which are relatively general functions. But at the same time, you have very, very few polynomials compared to differentiable or analytic functions. And so it's, it's both a geometry that's um, sort of general enough to generate interesting examples, but also special enough that you have a lot of tools and you can actually say a lot about these types of objects. So I'll give some, start by giving some examples. So uh, the most basics would be just affine subspaces. So what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean you take a linear subspace and you take a translate of it. So a point, a line, a plane, and so on and so forth, seen as subspaces of of n-dimensional complex plays, those, those would all be examples of algebraic varieties, right? Because there's, there's, zero, there's sets of solutions of some system of linear equations. So a slightly more interesting examples would be uh, hypersurfaces of degree D. So what is a hypersurface? You start with one polynomial in n variables. And I'm going to require it to not be constant, because if it's constant, I'm not getting a very interesting uh, system of polynomial equations. And I'm going to look at the zero set of that polynomial. So that's the point x1, xn, such that f of x1 up to xn is equal to 0. All right, so that's going to be a subset of cn, and that's going to be a very important example of an algebraic variety. So a particular uh, instance of that would be something that we know and love. You could take f to be x squared plus y squared minus 1, and you'll get the circle. Really, it's the complex points of the circle, but you know, this is just the circle. So what, what's our goal today? Our goal is going to be to talk about a certain notion of complexity for these algebraic varieties. So uh, uh, measure the complexity of the set of solutions uh, 
to a system of polynomial equations. Right, so there's all, all manners of complexity that we, one could c think of, right? You could ask, you know, how many solutions are there? Typically, there's going to be infinitely many, but you could ask for the dimension of the space of solutions. There's all sorts of different measures of complexity that one could consider. In our case, uh, it's going to be a measure of complexity which grew out of this notion of rationality that I'll introduce in a minute. And it's going to at first seem perhaps slightly convoluted, but uh, I promise it's well moderated by these, these types of questions. Okay, so uh, to introduce this notion of a rational variety, I'll talk to you about what it means uh, to find solutions to a system of polynomial equations. Okay, and this is going to be uh, really basic, but uh, I think it's enlightening. So let's go back to linear algebra. So let's say I give you a system of linear equations, let's say y minus 2x is equal to 1, and x plus z is equal to 3. All right, so this set that I wrote down is a set of solutions to a system of linear equations. But if in your linear algebra class, if on your exam you were given the system, and you were asked to find the solutions to this system, and you wrote that as an answer, uh, your teacher would probably think that you're being kind of cheeky and that you didn't really understand the class. Or maybe you understand the class too well. Now, when we say find the so solutions to a system, we don't mean just write down the set of solutions like that, right? We mean really parameterize the solutions. So really what we mean is, is that we want to write it in the following way. So for instance, you have a parameterization of this thing. We didn't learn how to do this in linear algebra. All right, so what is it? You know, those are two descriptions of the same set, but one is a description as a preimage. All right, so on the left-hand side, you have the preimage of a function f from c cubed to c that takes x, y, z to y minus 2x, x plus z. So this set that I wrote, wrote up here is f inverse of 1 tree. On the right hand side, you have the description of this set as an image, right? The image of the function that I'm going to call h from c to c cubed. That takes t to t to t plus 1 minus t plus 3. So the notion of rationality comes from, from this, this notion of parametrizing the set of solutions to a system of polynomial equations. So the question, you know, in, in, in linear algebra, whenever you write down a, a system of linear equations, you can always parametrize a solution. Right? We learn how to do this. Right? this when, we, when we say that we learn how to solve system of linear equations in linear algebra, what we mean is that we learn how to parametrize them in this way. So the question arises, can we always do this? Can you always parametrize the set of solutions to a system of not linear equations, but equations of higher degree? So let me give you another example of what that might look like in a slightly more interesting example. So let's take y to be uh, xy, such that x squared plus y squared is equal to 1, right? The circle. So how can I parameterize a circle? Does anybody have a suggestion? All right, I'll give you a suggestion. <laughs> so you can always parameterize it with trigonometric functions, right? You could send theta to uh, cosine theta sine theta, right? That's one way to parameterize a circle. But we don't want to consider it that way. Um, so the reason why we don't want to consider this parameterization is because these functions are analytic functions, but they're not algebraic in any meaningful sense. So they're not ratios of polynomials. So I want to disregard this parameterization, but there is still a way to parameterize a circle in, in the type of way that I want to talk about. So what's, what's this way? What, one thing you could do is you could, so you could write down your circle, and you could fix this point here, the point minus 1, 0. So I could write down a parameterization that goes from C to y, so to points on the circle, and that associate to t the intersection. So what I take, I take this point, I take a line of slope t, and I look at the intersection point here. And you see that the intersection point, you can just, you know, this is quite easy, you just compute, it's 1 minus t squared over 1 plus t squared, 2t over 1 plus t squared. So this is a parameterization of the circle, 
And it has the advantage, as opposed to the other parameterization that I gave you before, it has the advantage that these two functions are rational functions. And so how, how can I see, for instance, that this is a parameterization of the, the circle? You can see that it's a parameterization of the circle because these two functions, these two rational functions, actually satisfy the equation of the circle. So if I plug them into the equation of the circle, if I square this and I square the y-coordinate 2t over 1 plus t squared, this is identically equal to 1. Right? So this is why this is uh, a parameterization of the circle. OK, one, ad one disadvantage that you have with this parameterization, you see, is that I didn't write a, uh, a normal arrow. I wrote a dotted arrow. And the reason why I wrote a dotted arrow is that this parameterization is not defined everywhere. right? When t is equal to plus or minus i, you get a 0 on the denominator, and things are, are a little bit messed up. So that's what we call a rational map. And, and we call this a rational parameterization of the circle. Rational map because those functions are rational functions. If you prefer, it's the map that's not defined everywhere. OK, uh, so we, we do have a rational parameterization of the circle. And not only that, we actually have an inverse to that parameterization. So I can go from the complex numbers to the circle, or I could go from the circle to the complex number by just taking x, y, and sending it to the slope of the line that goes between x, y, and the point minus 1, 0. And that would be y over x plus 1. And you see that this parameterization really has an inverse. I mean, what does it mean to say that it has an inverse? Those two functions are not defined everywhere. But everywhere they're defined when you compose them, you get the identity. OK. Um, so by the way, if you've seen this before, you might have seen it in the setting of, of number theory. So one of the things that uh, I'm not really going to talk about, but which is really kind of a beautiful part of the subject in some sense, um, it's not, when I say in some sense, it's, it is a beautiful part of the subject. That's not what I'm trying to say. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is the, the kind of revival on these types of question uh, is much more geometric and not so much arithmetic. So what is the relation with number theory? You see that this parameterization, if I plug in a rational number over here, I'm getting a point with rational coordinates over there, right? If I plug in, if t is a rational number, then both these entries are rational numbers. So this takes rational numbers to points with rational coordinates. Same thing for the inverse. If you have a point with rational coordinates and you, you, you do this, you also get a rational number. So this is basically a bijection between the rational numbers and the points on the circle with rational coordinates. If you forget about the, this point minus 1, 0. Right? So if I forget about this point minus 1, 0, I basically parameterize all the rational points on this circle. But what's a, what's a rational point on the circle? You know, a rational point on the circle is something like this, a, b, c, d, uh, a, b, c, let's call it c, b. Because I, I could always make, uh, well, OK. Uh, um, Maybe I should put it the other way around. <laughs> so the, the rational points on the circle give you Pythagorean triples. Because if you have a Pythagorean triple, so what's a Pythagorean triple? It's a triple of integers such that a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. Right, if I have a Pythagorean triple like this, I could divide throughout by c squared. And I get o of a over c squared plus b over c squared is equal to 1. That's exactly a point on the circle with rational coordinates. All right, so you see, in this way, you can parameterize all the Pythagorean triples. So this is, this is why you would see about this parameterization. In number theory, and it kind of highlights why knowing about such parameterizations might be, might be useful. OK, so these, exam these examples suggest that maybe it's always possible to find a rational parameterization, but this turns out to not be the case. Having a rational parameterization is actually quite, quite special. So let me give you an example of a variety that doesn't have a rational parameterization. So I could look at the following variety. So this does not admit a rational parameterization. So let's see what that means. So what that means is that for every choice of two rational functions, 
So what's a rational function? It's a ratio of two polynomials, right? So this is the field of rational functions, a field whose elements are ratios of polynomials. So if I pick two rational functions, and I look at the map h from c to c squared, that takes t to p of t, q of t, then the image of h is not going to be contained inside of this x. So in other words, uh, q of t squared minus p of t cubed plus p of t is not going to be identically 0. All right, so this turns out to not have uh, a rational parametrization. And really, this is the case of most algebraic varieties. Most things are not going to have rational parametrization. So this, uh, this observation justifies the following definition. So a variety x is rational. So maybe I should, uh, is rational uh, if it admits a rational parameterization. with a rational inverse. All right, so we could certainly ask for just having a rational parameterization without caring about the inverse. That's another notion which is called unirational. So I'm not going to get into this, but um, I'll just make a plug for this class that I'm teaching in the in the summer. So if you're interested in, in these questions, the first, first part of the talk, basically, I'll be exploring that in, in much greater detail uh, in this class that I'll teach in the summer. So what do you mean by Yeah, so I, what I mean is, you know, h is partially defined. Uh, I, I want to have a partially defined function that's also given by, by ratios of polynomials. And you want that the, on the overlap of their domain of definition, basically, uh, they're inverses of one another. Good question. Any other question? Okay, so let's talk about what is the what are these rationality problems. So what do I mean by rationality problems? Uh, so it's a whole set of questions, but in their perhaps their most simple form, it's simply uh, how to determine. if a variety is rational or not. And this is really a set of questions that's at the center of algebraic geometry. And in general, it's really quite hard. So the way that you do it is you, you cook up some invariant, which vanishes, uh, typically vanishes when the variety is rational and doesn't vanish when the variety is not rational. OK, well, that's much easier said than done, right? I just told you in general, how do you show that two things are not equal or something, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's a much more difficult task than it looks. What, part of the problem is this definition between having a rational parameterization and having a rational parameterization that has an inverse. So there's a lot of natural invariants that you can cook up that actually vanish only if you have a rational parameterization, that don't really see that whether, you know, the, the inverse as being an important thing. Right? So there's a lot of natural invariants that you cook up that are able to distinguish between varieties that are unirational and varieties that are not rational or that are not unirational. What's really hard is to distinguish between varieties that are unirational, so that have a rational parameterization but are not rational, and rational varieties. So in general, this is really quite a, quite a difficult task. And I'll, I want to talk about a little bit of the progress that's happened in this field over the past, let's say, 15 years. Because there's been really, it's been a very active area of research. And I want to focus on the case of uh, hypersurfaces. So I'm going to let XD be a general hypersurface of degree D. So by general, I just mean, if, if you don't know what general means, just think about random. So maybe it's not true for all hypersurfaces, but for most hypersurfaces, it's going to be true. Right? So what we're interested in is trying to understand when this xd is rational, when it's not rational, and so on. 
So I'll, I'll put D on some, some axis like this. There's no reason to, it just goes off like this. So if D is equal to one, is it rational or not? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so if, if D is equal to one, we're doing linear algebra. It's a hypersurf. It's a hyperplane, right? A hyperplane is rational because, well, by linear algebra, you can parameterize the solutions and whatnot, right? So this is rational. If d is equal to two, it's also rational. It's a little bit harder to prove, but it's not difficult at all to prove that it's rational for d equal to, to two. Uh, so in both of these cases, we know what happens completely. So cer certainly, we know what happens in case of d equals three, right? And the answer is no. It becomes extremely hard in for d equals three. And that's kind of somewhat typical. You know, d equals one, we're basically doing linear algebra. d equals two, we're basically doing bilinear algebra. <laughs> and d equals three, we're typically screwed. So we're, we, know, we, don't, we don't really know what happens starting with d equals three. On the other uh, side, if d is greater or equal to n plus two, then it's not rational. And it's, it's relatively easy to show that that's the case. So really the interesting, so that, that includes, that includes, uh, sorry, that's kind of a closed bracket. So that includes degree n plus two. And so really the interesting case is, is, is this range between three and n plus two. So this is the, in, let me call it the interesting range. So to give you a, an, an idea a little bit of the, the progress that's happened in this field is uh, I'll give you two terms. Uh, one is due to Kolar. And there are two terms about exactly the same thing. Just one, one came more than 20 years before the other. And both of these were really remarkable breakthroughs. So the claim is that most hypersurfaces of degree d greater or equal to are not rational, uh, are not rational. Right, so what's gonna change here is, is what the bound is, right? So we already know that if you have a, a general hypersurface with really large, large degree, it's not gonna be rational. And you know, but basically we expect that things to the left here are rational, things to the right go, you know, are further and further from being rational. So what Kolar proved is if it's uh, twice n plus three, n plus, I think it's n plus two over three. Uh, I'm not sure this is quite right, but that's what I have in my notes. So that's roughly right, roughly two thirds of n. Right. So what Kolar proved really is that you know this in this interesting range you can forget about the right third of it. That's already, you already know that that's not rational. And this is not easy. This is not easy at all. Like, it's a really clever argument. There's some degeneration, degeneration to characteristic P. It's like, you know, it, it sort of uses the fact that, um, you know, in, in some sense, the fact that this is not rational here has to do with uh, some cohomology classes that you can produce on these varieties. And he, they, kind of, they can be produced kind of by magic and characteristic P in a larger range by some degeneration argument. So this is really not uh, an easy proof at all. Um, on the other hand, this, this proof of Schreider, so he improves it dramatically. So wh while Kolar was able to shave off a third, what Schreider does is really shave it, off, shave it all off, right? So if n is really, really large, log base two of n is really, really small. So you know, we still don't know anything about degree three hypersurfaces, any amount of generality. But the second that you look at hypersurfaces that are not of really small degree compared to n, you know that they're not going to be rational. And actually, this Strider term is much better than that. It's stronger than just not rational. It's not stably rational or whatnot. So this is really kind of breathtaking progress that, that's, that's been done. And this builds on a lot of work, work of Voisin, Coyotelen, Pirudka, Totero, and, and other people. So this is kind of the progress part of, of the discussion on rationality problems, but I also want to highlight that there are a lot of really basic things that we don't know. So uh, a very basic conjecture that we don't know is that uh, the claim is that most hypersurfaces of degree three 
in C5 are not rational. So this is this is kind of a this is sort of a folklore conjecture, uh, but there was a lot of work done by Hassett and also by Kuznetsov. on this particular question. So this is really you know, a very simple question, right? Hypersurface of degree three, those are, those are called cubic fourfolds. Cubic because it's degree three, and fourfold because it has dimension four. Right? So this is really the first kind of in case that we absolutely have no idea how to do anything. And it's a really beautiful problem, and it's connected to all sorts of breathtakingly gorgeous geometry and algebra geometry. So this is really, you know, uh, a central question, but this is, you know, for God's sake, these are like really, you know, they're not 150 dimensional. We're not talking about any, there's no Tarski monsters hiding under the, this is like, <laughs> this is like a pretty simple object, right? But, uh, and has, has conjecture predicts that the rational ones are dense, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if, I don't know if in his paper he has any conjectures that are written kind of black on white. I couldn't, I don't think that, but yeah, the, the intuition is usually have a dense set of, uh, of rational ones. In, in that case, yeah. yeah. For, I mean, there's a question of, um, I don't, I'm not sure who it was, but I think there was a question that was asked, you know, can you show that the, uh, uh, let's just look at cubic hypersurfaces of dimension bigger than four and, uh, um, can you find any degree in which, you know, like if the dimension is large enough, are they rational, basically? And, you know, that's not even known, right? If you take a, a hypersurface of degree three and 100 dimensional, general hypersurface of degree three and 100 dimensional space, it's not even known whether that's rational or not. One might think that it's not rational, right? One might think that as the dimension increases, maybe the range where they're rational extends beyond just quadrics, maybe cubics become rational, but that's not known either, right? So almost, there's very, very little that's known on the, just the general question of rationality of cubics. It's known in degree two, degree three, sorry, in dimension two and dimension three, and then starting with dimension four onwards, it's wide open. Okay, any questions about this? All right. No, not at all. It's a completely different method. So um, it uses like unramified cohomology, and it's like a, there's a generation involved, but it's not the it's not the color of the generation. Okay. So the second topic I want to talk about this is really where we get into these measures of irrationality. So curves of loganality. So let me take x to be an algebraic curve. Right? So if you prefer, if you're more comfortable with you know, complex manifold, this is a Riemann surface. Right? So you take x to be a Riemann surface if you want. And typically, you're going to have two, you have two classical invariants attached to such an object. One is extremely classical, and presumably all of you have heard about it, uh, which is the genus of the curve, g of x. So you know, if you prefer, uh, just topologically, this is a complex, compact surface. The, from the definition, I told you it's not compact, but you know, <laughs> compactify it. Now it's a complex, compact surface, and you have a certain number of holes in the surface, right? And, uh, by the classification of, it's orientable because it's a complex surface, and so you have a certain number of holes. And for instance, in this case, you would have three holes, right? So that would be a genus tree curve. The second invariant is uh, significantly less well known. And I think the reason why it's significantly less, less well known is the genus is deformation invariant. So it's really something that topologists and differential geometers care about. The second one is called the gonality. And this is really an algebraic invariant. It's not something that's deformation invariant anymore. So the gonality is denoted gon of x. All right, so what is, what is before I tell you what this gonality is, let me remind you uh, what it meant for a variety to be rational. Like, I'll remind you that a variety is rational, so x is rational, or a curve is rational, if there exists a rational parameterization. 
and a rational inverse to this parameterization. So to talk about ganality, we're, we're going to forget about this notion of rational parameterization, and we're going to focus on the inverse. And there's one thing that we get. So not only do we have an inverse, but since, since this is an inverse, it's one-to-one, -one, right? This is basically a bijection, right? So this is essentially a bijection. So we're going to say that this has degree one, right? And, and the topological degree, if you want, is one. When you take a general point over here, it has a single preimage over there. Right, so you're rational if and only if you have a map to C that has degree one. That's the equivalent to being rational. And so a natural thing you can do is just ask, okay, well, maybe you don't have a map to C that's degree one, but maybe you have a map to C that's of degree two, or of degree three, or of degree four, right? And so this justifies this notion of orthogonality, which is the minimal degree of a map to C. So the gonality of X is the minimum over the degree of f, where f from x to c uh, is non-constant. Saying that it's not constant is really the same thing as saying that the image is dense. All right, so this is the minimal degree such that you're, you can realize your curve as a ramified covering of the, of the complex line. Uh, of degree D. So in particular, the, gon the gonality of X is equal to 1 if and only if X is rational. And this is really you know, standard, very well studied invariant of algebraic curves. And th in this sense, this is why we call it a measure of irrationality, because it really measures the failure of X to be rational. In some sense, the genus also measures the failure of X to be rational, but this is kind of closer to you know, this really tells something about maps to projective space or maps to the complex line. Okay, so let me give you some, uh, an example. Let's go back to this example that we had before of this curve that we, sh well, we didn't show. We said, I said that uh, it was not rational. So y squared minus x cubed plus x is equal to zero. So you could draw this thing. Uh, I fished this picture from at some point, I, I plotted this thing, <laughs> this thing, so apparently that's what it looks like. So uh, these are the axes. They're not part of the curve. The curve really just looks like this. It's this kind of egg and then this piece over here. And there's a map from x to c that just takes a pair x, y and associates to it the x coordinate. Right, so from in this picture, what this map does is you take a line over here, and this is really kind of a projection, projects to the x-axis, if you want. OK, so uh, what is the degree of this map? Well, you can check relatively easily that it's a degree 2 map. So the degree is the number of preimages generically, right? So if I take this point over here, it's going to have two preimages over there. If I take this point over here, it has two preimages over there, right? So all I'm saying basically is that you know, these horizontal lines meet this curve in two points. So you might protest, OK, well, what if I take this horizontal line? Does not mean the curve at all? So you know, I'm cheating. But it doesn't mean the curve. It just means it in two complex points. So you just have to exercise your imagination a little bit and think that they lie outside of the plane. So the, the reason is really when you're looking at a preimage over a point x, you're looking at, so let's call this f. f inverse of x naught is really, uh, so it's, it's the, this is really the set of y's such that y squared is equal to x naught. So I mean, maybe let me put it this way. f inverse of x naught is equal to x naught y, such that y squared is equal to x naught cubed minus x naught. Right, so it makes it clear in this way that what you're do doing when you're taking the preimage is really taking a square root, right? You have two, in general, you're going to have two square roots. Sometimes you're going to have one square root. Those are called the ramification points. So the picture here is, is basically the following. You know, the, this is your curve, and it's got four ramification points. So it looks like this. And this is C over here. This is my x. And this is what the map looks like. So typically, I'm going to have two preimages, but there's four points where I have exactly one preimage. OK, any question about this?
All right. So as I said, this is a, a very classically studied invariant. So I'm not going to have too much to say about the ganality of curves in, in general. This is something that's really well studied. But what I want to talk about is ganality of, the ganality of curves inside of some algebraic varieties. And somehow there, there's some really basic terms that have been uh, missed or you know, kind of haven't been noticed. So this is a term uh, from, I think, 2022 that I proved at Lazarsfeld. And uh, this term involves tree hyperelliptic. It's just a term about hyperelliptic curves in some sense. So if you take x and y, so, uh, all right, so those are going to be general, so random, if you will, general hyperelliptic curves. So what is a hyperelliptic curve? So hyperelliptic means the gonality is equal to 2, and the genus is greater or equal to 2. That's what, it, that's what it means to be hyperelliptic. So they're double covers of the plane, and they're not of genus 1. That's all I mean. So if you take 2, a uh, general hyperelliptic curve, and C inside of x cross y, so given A hyperelliptic curve. <laughs> then C is equal to x cross a point, or C is equal to a point cross y. Okay, so what, what am I saying here? I'm saying you take two general hyperelliptic curves, x and y, and if I give you any curve in the product, it's not going to be hyperelliptic. The only way you're going to have a hyperelliptic curve in the product is if you take a stupid curve. If you take this, well, you know, clearly that's hyperelliptic because that's just a copy of y that you slid into the product, right? Same thing if you take this over here, that's also hyperelliptic for stupid reasons. It's just isomorphic to x, right? So what we're saying is that those are the only ones. You don't have any other hyperelliptic curves in this. And this is, you know, this is striking in several ways. It's striking because, uh, you know, it's a very simple statement. There's, you have this hyperelliptic curve, hyperelliptic curve, hyperelliptic curve. These are tremendously well-studied objects, you know, they date back to, to Riemann and so on. And the second thing that's surprising is we couldn't find a simple proof. The proof we have is, like, horrible. It's, like, really hard. And this is a really simple statement. This should be easy to prove. There should be, like, something that's, there's got to be something that we're missing that makes this easy. So this is kind of a challenge to you. Try to find a simple proof of this statement. And uh, embarrass both of us. That would be lovely. Uh, and so we, and we, we have a conjecture that this is actually kind of a general phenomenon. So the conjecture uh, is basically the same thing. So if you take two general curves, so maybe not hyperelliptic curves, just take two general curves, now, now the claim is that anything in the product should have relatively large ganality. So if you have something in the product that has really small ganality, it's got to be one of the two axes, basically, just a copy of x or a copy of y. Conjecture the following: so x, y, um, general curves. Uh, and c inside of x cross y, uh, c not equal to x cross a point or a point cross y. So take an interesting curve inside of the product. Uh, sorry, I started. So there exists a constant a greater than 0 such that given the gonality of c is greater or equal to a times the gonality of x times the gonality of y. All right, so what we're saying here is we expect the gonality of curves inside the product to be roughly multiplicative. And perhaps with some constant, but it, you, don't, you shouldn't have curves that are really simple inside of a product of, of two curves. By the way, I mean, this, this statement about general, these are really important, right? Because if you take x is equal to y, if x is equal to y, then you have the diagonal inside of it, right? Pairs of points that are equal to each other. And that's actually, we, we have a follow-up paper where we say that if you take x, a general hyperelliptic curves, and you look at x, x cross x, then the only thing you have are, are you're going to have these fibers, those fibers, you're going to have the diagonal. And 
on a hyperelliptic curve, you always have a hyperelliptic involution. So you're going to have kind of a type of anti-diagonal. That's the graph of the hyperelliptic involution. And again, you know, all these things are proven using similar methods that are not, they're not methods that have anything to do with curves. They're methods that have things to do with abelian varieties. And so it would be really nice to find something that really uses the geometry of the curves in a, in a more meaningful way. OK. Uh, the, this is a conjecture. No, zero. Do you know that the gonality is at least four? Uh, uh, so that's a very good question. Uh, I didn't. I kind of wrote the most simplified term, but yes, we know that the gonality is at least four. Aside from, uh, if you take a product of two genus two curves, I cannot prove that there's no trigonal curves inside of a product of two genus two curves. But aside from that, we know that it's at least four. I mean, I think. Just to be sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think, I think, I think Rob wanted to edge. I, I think A should be one, but. Uh, one <laughs> Oh no, I mean, I think it should be one. You know? I mean, maybe, maybe take it one over one thousand, just to be, <laughs> just to be safe. But yeah, I mean, I think it's just to edge. Uh, I just, you know, to, to say it's multiplicative instead of just uh, making a bold uh, stance, taking a bold stance on the matter. So the last thing I want to talk about is the degree of irrationality and some questions uh, related to this, this notion. So this is a notion that generalizes uh, the gonality of a curve just directly. And so it's an invariant that's defined in the following way. So the degree of irrationality of x is the minimum over the degree of f, where f Again, it's a partially defined morphism from x to c dim x. And you're asking here for it to be dominant. And what it means for it to be dominant is just saying that it, it, it really kind of, the image is dense. You don't want it to map to a curve or to map to something of a smaller dimension. So you want it to have finite fibers in particular. You want most fibers to be finite and so that you can have this notion of degree where you're counting the size of the fiber. Right? So this only talking about the degree of a morphism. If you have a morphism whose fibers are curves, does it make sense to talk about the degree? I mean, not in this simple topological sense. Okay, so uh, uh, if X is a curve, then it's it's easy to see that the degree of irrationality of X is just the gonality of X. Really, it's the same definition. Right, so this is just a generalization of the notion of gonality to varieties of higher dimension. Why, you know, why on earth would we call it the degree of irrationality, <laughs> not just the gonality of X? Because uh, it was coined by, you know, it's just out of respect <laughs> to people that coined it that were more in kind of the algebra side of this, because you can talk about all these things from the point of view of field theory. So they were talking about it from the point of view of field theory in the 80s, maybe, or something like that. And so just out of deference, we've stuck to the name degree of irrationality. And uh, another thing is that the degree of irrationality of x is equal to 1 if and only if x is rational. So this is for the same reason that I mentioned in the case of curves. So this is why we call it a measure of irrationality. It's an invariant, which is 1 if the variety is rational, and that grows the further the variety gets from being rational. So this is, uh, this is an invariant that's really hard to compute. And it's really hard to compute. It's clear that it's going to be very hard to compute in general. Because if you could compute it in all the cases, then you would know exactly what varieties are rational. And that problem is incredibly hard. So there's no reason for this problem to be easier than, you know, it's at least as hard as computing which varieties are rational. In practice, uh, you know, when we try to compute it, I don't, I'm not trying to compute this thing for cubic fourfolds, because then I would just be trying to check whether cubic fourfolds are rational or not. I'm trying to compute this for varieties which we know are not rational, and we're trying to quantify how far these varieties are from being rational. So this is really the, the setup in which I'm trying to compute these things. And the, the, the situation right now is that we have really few examples of, of this degree of irrational, because we have really few ways of, of computing it. But I'll give you some problems, for instance, uh, that, uh, that we really don't know how to do at the moment. So uh, one would be find non-trivial lower bounds 
for the degree of irrationality of, uh, so one of them is uh, K-tree surfaces. That's a really interesting situation in which the methods we have are just not suited to deal with K-tree surfaces at all. So there's conjectures related to what the degree of irrationality should be. It's conjecture that if you look at the K-trees that have larger and larger polarization, they should be more and more complex from this point of view of rationality. Another one is hypersurfaces of low degree. And what I mean by low degree is, in particular, less than or equal to uh, like 2n plus 2, or less than 2n plus 2. But in particular, in, in the final range, in the case where you know we have this theorem of Schreider, for instance, that tells us that these hypersurfaces are not rational, it would be nice to say that they're far from being rational. Or, you know, at least they're not double covers of the plane or something like that. So here we really have uh, nothing to say Sorry. either. Uh, so, you know, those are algebraic varieties. So you can always put them in projective space or you put them in, com you know, the way I define them, they live inside of complex space, right? So you can always project uh, to, right? So you can take some plane and you can just project into that. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, all right, so and, and another question, I didn't leave myself enough room, but let me put it here. Uh, another question is if x and y are general curves, is the degree of irrationality of x times y equal to the degree of irrationality of x times the degree of irrationality of y? So, of course, that's just the ganality of x times the ganality of y. So, you know, in some sense, this is very much related to this conjecture that we make. It's just a much weaker statement, right? So uh, there we're really talking about coverings. Here we're saying there's no curves of that, of that ganality. So if you knew the theorem, if you knew that the, the, the ganality of curves, interesting curves have to have ganality, at least the product, for instance, then you would automatically know that the degree of irrationality is the product of the degree of irrationality. So this is really kind of a central question, just how does it behave with respect to products? We know that it's not multiplicative. So if you take any curves, x and y, we know that it's not multiplicative. So there's instances in which it is, you know, the, the degree of irrationality drops when you take the product, uh, but it's really not well understood when it doesn't drop, for instance. Okay, so uh, let me, I have about 10 minutes left, so let me focus on one question that I find uh, particularly interesting, and that's been it's kind of my albatross that I've been trying to shake off my neck for since, ever since I wrote my thesis, basically. Uh, which hopefully, like, uh, hopefully it's gonna take me less than 15 years to, <laughs> could be that, uh, that it does take 15 years, but I don't think it's as hard of a problem as whatever you ended up thinking about. So, um, so the problem is the following. So, uh, so here's another question, which is really a special case of the previous question. So, so if E and F are uh, general elliptic curves, so those are just genus one curves, if you want. Is the degree of irrationality of E times F equal to 4. Okay, so this is a, a specific case of the question that I just gave you before, but it's the simplest case. You take two genus 1 curves. is the product of the degree of irrationality, the degree of irrationality of the product. And this is, this is it's easy to find out, it's easy to see that you have a degree 4 map, because you could take E cross F, and E maps 2 to 1 to, P, to, to C, F maps 2 to 1 to C. So when you take the product, this, the product is going to map 4 to 1. Right? So it's easy to write down a 4 to 1 map. What's hard is to show that you don't have any 3 to 1 maps. So it's actually very easy to show that the degree of irrationality of E cross F is less than or equal to 4, just by the argument that I just gave you here. And it's very easy to show that it's less than or equal to 3. So this is really easy. 
But to show that tree doesn't happen is really quite hard. And I, I proved the theorem which is really close to this, but unfortunately it doesn't apply in this situation. And so let me just write down what the theorem is. So if A is, uh, so let me put it this way, most of on surfaces have the degree of irrationality, uh, so have the degree of irrationality for. Unfortunately, uh, parts of elliptic curves are exactly the types of <laughs> abelian surfaces where this theorem doesn't apply. So you can't use that to prove that they have the degree of irrationality for. OK, so this seems like, you know, Right, sure, I mean, it's something where you can easily construct a map of the degree tree. You'd like to show that there's no maps of the degree two tree. You know, why, why, why do you care about, you know, why are you obsessed with this problem? And, you know, part of it is because it's become, to me, it's a very simple uh, way to look for a counterexample to a more general statement that's become really important in, in the field. So the statement is, the question is the question of specialization. But the question is, if you have a family of algebraic varieties, how does the degree of irrationality vary in family, right? So it can happen that you, there, there are cases where the degree of irrationality we know can, um, we know that it can drop. So you, you could have a, a variety that's, uh, you could have a, a series of varieties that are, that are far from being rational, and then suddenly you, you look at one special member where then it's closer to being rational. What we don't know is whether the opposite can happen. Can you specialize? Can you have a family of varieties? And when you look at a special mem member, this one somehow is further from being rational than the other ones. Right? So that's the question. So the question is. Yeah, so that's basically the question, right? So uh, we'd like to show that it's, I mean, the question is whether it is. I can never keep lower and <laughs> upper. <laughs> we'd like to show that it, it can never, it can never jump up on their specialization. And when I say we'd like to show is in my case, I'd like to show that it's not true. I think it's not true. So the question is, uh, given a smooth family such that the degree of irrationality of the fibers is less than or equal to k for, uh, for t generic. Right? So, you know, what this is saying is suppose you take a, a family of smooth algebraic varieties, you know, so that it's just a, just a nice family, and suppose that all the members, you know, most of the members are close to being rational. So they're kind of k-fold covers of the plane or, or of, of, the, of CN. Uh, so does it follow The degree of irrationality of xt is less than or equal to k for all, all t. And my, my guess is the answer is no. And my guess is the answer is, is no because, uh, because I think this is 4. <laughs> and you can write down a family of abelian surfaces that specialize to products of elliptic curves and such that er most members have a degree tree map. So you can, you can find a family of abelian surfaces, most members of which has, have a degree tree. And they specialize in this way to a product of elliptic curves. So you'd expect that when you specialize to a product of elliptic curve, then the degree of irrationality jumps up to be, to be 4. So let me go further and let me tell you why would one care about the specialization question. And the specialization question fits into a, a natural uh, setup in the, in the question of in these rationality problems. Because um, so there's a theorem, a recent theorem of Kuncevich and Schenkel, that says that uh, rationality specializes in smooth families. So if you have a family of varieties that are rational, a smooth family, and the general member is rational, then every member is 
that we remember is going to be rational. So in particular, uh, i.e., the answer is a resounding yes if k is equal to 1. So if you have a family of varieties that have the groove of rationality less or equal to k, and then you specialize every member as the groove of rationality less or equal to k. So that's one side. And also another thing is uh, the answer is also yes. if uh, the dimension of xt is equal to 1. So if this family of varieties is just a family of curves, we know that the gonality of curves specializes in smooth families. So we know that the, 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 the gonality of a curve in a family can only drop. It cannot increase. So we have kind of two points of reference. Curves that tells us it, it cannot increase. Rational varieties that tells us it cannot increase. And I'm trying to show that you know, if you're not a curve <laughs> and if you're not a rational variety, then basically in every other case, you know, it, it can jump up. Of course, I mean, uh, I'm, I'd be very satisfied with just one case where it jumps up. Otherwise, like, I think it just becomes kind of bookkeeping. It's, if you have one case where it jumps, uh, jumps up, already you've kind of shown that the general statement is, is true. So that would be um, plenty for me. OK, so I'll, uh, you know, I'll leave you on that. And um, um, so if you're interested, come talk to me. I'm always happy to talk to people. And I'll be teaching this class in the, in the summer. It's not going to be so much about the second part of the talk that had to do with these measures of irrationality. It's really going to focus on the first part of the talk. So we'll talk about, a lot about the history and sort of how these, these problems came about and a lot of the methods that have been devised. So for instance, this theorem of Kolar that we talked about, for sure we're going to discuss that. And, hopefully go through the proof in some amount of detail. The second talk of Schre the second term by Schreider, I think we don't won't have time to get all the way there. It's just too much. But 